Hi, Armethea. How are you doing? Uh, I guess <laughs> great. Great. Good. Good. Um, uh, halfway through doing, not even halfway through these tests yet. Oh. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Uh, a pretty lot much, of work. Pretty much through the fourth question, though. Oh, a lot any, of work. Any, anything you have any questions about, Armethea? No. Not really. Okay, just hang around. We'll we'll uh, begin at. Uh, we'll definitely begin the lecture at five thirty. And if somebody has any questions, it may be worthwhile listening to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If um, you have any questions at all, I'm here. That's your question. The exam. You're still grading them, right? Yes, I am. I'm grading them one question at a time. One question and at a time, like uh, per person, or like. You're going in the like you do the something. whole class. I'm grading like question one the whole class, then question oh, okay. two, and right now I have eight more people. Your your uh, question four has been graded, okay? So through <laughs> question four, yours has been graded. I have eight more people to get through to uh, uh, finish this round. Okay. And I'll be honest. I don't know when I will get them done. Okay. Uh. Sorry, it's, that's the nature of doing a, a test with problems in it. It takes a long time to look through them. Okay. All right. Have any questions other than that? No. Okay. Uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, we're going to be starting on gas laws this evening. Uh, I'm going to just go back and continue. I'd like to get through this question four before I end. Uh, so if it's okay with you, I'm just gonna do that unless you have any questions. I think we have agreed. Yep. <laughs> uh, can you see the screen right now? Can you see the screen that's at the top CHM 1025 introductory chemistry? Can no, you see, I can't it? see it? Good. You're not supposed to. Okay. Hi, Andrew, how you doing? Andrew? Hey. How you doing tonight? Good, good, good. Did you get my email? Yeah, yeah, I'm good, my bad. I mean, to be honest with you, I think that if I can, um, okay. But the grading's still not done, right? No, 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 not, not by any means. I'm only, I'm through to, uh, four on yours. Oh, okay, thank God. Uh, do you want? Like, I worked so hard on that test. I got so scared when I saw the zero or the 10, whatever it was. Uh, Andrew. Yeah. I think you got 50 out of 50 so far. You got 50 out of 50. You got 50 out of 50 so far, Andrew. I knew you were doing really well. I just didn't know how well. So we'll keep it up and see what's going on. I hope so. Thank you. Um, uh, during my test, my uh, honor lock froze up and I lost like 10 minutes on the last problem. 
I'm not sure, but I tried to answer as much as I could on the last one. Well, I'm, it's Spencer, right? Yeah. Let me look at it for a second and see, see where you're at. Yeah, that actually happens a lot. Yeah, uh, you did one big problem here, Spencer. You didn't change the milliliters into liters. That's all. That's basically all you did wrong with that problem, I think. Dang it. Uh, where is the, where's my cheat sheet? How you doing, Professor? Hi, Professor. Hello? He may be muted. Oh. Ah, oh, there he is. Sorry, what happened was I kicked out my microphone. Uh, <laughs> Spencer. Yeah? What you did was you didn't, first of all, you didn't change the milliliters into liters. Okay? okay. Then the second thing, you didn't realize that that was <laughs> lead acetate. I was asking about lead phosphate. So you had okay. to multiply the moles of lead acetate by one over three, the molar ratio to get the moles of uh, lead phosphate. And, okay. 
And the last thing is the molecular weight you have is, is not correct. Okay. The molecular weight was 811.5. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, other than the first, let's see where I'm at. I'm almost through the fourth question. Oh, so when you're, when you're seeing, it, you score, if you're seeing a score, score is out of 50 points so far. Don't freak out on me. I'm doing this question by question. You're getting it one by one for each student. Yes, correct. Yeah, okay, that's what that's why to. he uh, he sent the email and I was like, oh, thank God, because last time yeah. I I freaked the f out. So, yeah. uh, yeah. So that's what <laughs> that's what's happening. You guys are actually doing pretty good so far. I hope uh, so. That was hard. Define good. Uh, Victoria? Yeah. Listen, I'm very scared and anxious for my score, and uh, I shouldn't be having <laughs> coffee because that would just add to it. You, Victoria, you, know, Victoria you got 44 out of 50 points so far. Okay. I'm all right. Yeah, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> of course, those are the easiest questions, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got anything anybody has to t any to talk about. Are you doing like partial credit if we yep. messed up? We, you are? If you, for those of you that decided to show me some work, yes. Thank God. God bless. On the other <laughs> hand, on the other hand, if you give me a wrong answer and you give me no work, how can I give you partial credit? Oh, and here's another thing. I want somebody to divide 4.51 by 3.33. What was it? 4.51 by 3.33. 1.354. Ooh, 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 okay. So if that's a ratio, what number am I going to multiply by? What, if you've what? got a ratio of 1 to 1.35... What are you going to multiply it by to get a whole number? Oh. Oh, one. No. No, it's, no, it's two. Uh, if you multiply it by two, you get 2.70. Wait, I got it. Hold on. Don't Three. You it? Three. Three. I can't tell you how many of you divided 4.51 by 3.33 and got an answer of 1.5. You can't, you can't do that, guys. I thought you rounded uh, like one point because it was like one point. No, I, I'm talking. Even if in, I did that, I rounded wrong. <laughs> I, I did. And I'm talking empirical formula problems. Okay. When you're getting mm -hmm. the ratio between the atoms. Was that that vitamin? Yes, uh, it was. Was I one of those people that did? Yes, you were. <laughs> did I do it? Define an I. Who the hell are you? I can't see you. When you ask a question like, did I do it? I can't see who's really talking, guys. Oh, that was me. Oh, good. That helps. That helps to narrow it down. I now oh, have Andrew, gone from Andrew, I sorry, to me. Sorry. You still can't <laughs> see me. My bad. I forgot. Andrew. <laughs> Andrew, I no, Andrew, Andrew, you got the Andrew, I think you're 50 of 50. Didn't I tell you that? Oh, I thought you was, I thought you were going to another question. I, I, no, I, no, no, no. I'm still yeah. on question four. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I got to get that done. That, yeah, that of this, of everything so far, that's the most mind boggling that they had a whole bunch of you took 4.51, divided it by 3.33, and somehow came up with 1.5. Talking about the exam questions? Yep. Yep. Anything else? Anybody have any comments about the exam? But listen, if it was 1.5, at least some of us multiplied correctly to get a whole number. 
<laughs> Victoria, look at your exam and see if I wasn't generous. No, you were. You definitely were. I, I am looking at it. Okay. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen, you want to talk about? Are you still on question four? Or? I'm still on question four. Okay. I can't. <laughs> Literally speaking, I'm talking and trying to trying to grade at the same time. Who says I can't do two things at once? I'm just going to finish this one up and punta. Okay. So I'm through Hunter on, on this. No, you guys are doing, I'm seeing, seeing good grades. I'm seeing one, only one horrendous score. And the rest of you are doing very good so far. I'm, I'm well pleased with it so far. Probably until you hit that uh, ammonium question. Question seven. <laughs> you know something, guys? I've got... <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to do something for you guys on that. Don't trust me on it, all right? Can you do like an extra credit thing to make up for that problem? Like just that problem? What I'm probably going to do, and it's it, don't, don't take me on this 100% right now. What I'm probably going to do, if a lot of you did horrible on that question, I'm probably going to drop it. Oh, I'm probably, I You're am probably That's going it. to drop it. I if love you, you. If you <laughs> did, let's not get personal here. Uh, <laughs> if you did anything on that problem, the points will be act, will act like as extra credit. Oh, oh but yeah. that's probably what I'm going to do. I really want a video compilation of all of us looking at that problem and going, what the F is this? I, I, I would love to see twice. everyone's reaction. I agree, Tori. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, do you want to know how simple that was? Do you want to really want to know how simple it is? All right, you've seen, you've seen the slideshow now, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think the problem was something like this. Uh, two NH3. Um, N2 plus 3H2, right? And I said something like, you produce Okay, is that kind of the question, guys? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Do well, I know what you have to do to solve this? Percent of You know, honestly, I had one smart student that did this probably about five years ago. And I had intended, what I intended on doing, I'll do the hard way first. Okay, so you have 3217. Now stop that. 3217 grams of nitrogen times one mole over 28.02 grams equals Moles of nitrogen, right? Every, everybody with me there, right? 
So you do 32.17 divided by 28.02 and you get 115 moles. Or let's do it more exactly. One. All right. Now, if I've got 114.8 moles, I want to find out how much hydrogen because that's what the combined mixture is, right? So I multiply that by 3 moles H2 for 1 mole N2. And this gives me 344.4 moles hydrogen times 2.016 grams per mole equals 694.4 grams hydrogen. So the percent nitrogen is equal to the grams of nitrogen divided by grams of nitrogen and hydrogen. So it's 3217 divided by 399, 3911, which equals 82.25%. That's the long way. That's what I had intended on. This is the way I intended on having this problem be solved. I have one guy, one very, very smart guy in my class that said, oh, you know, due to the conservation of law of mass, I'm not going to lose any nitrogen or hydrogen going left to right. So all I have to do is take my nitrogen in my ammonia and divide it by my... Um, Divided by my molecular weight of nitrogen. And I get virtually the same answer. This is the, one of the questions on the exam, right? Cut, yes, I, I changed the numbers around. Because but, I'm looking at the same number on <laughs> mine for the ammonium, ammonia. Yeah. I'm looking at 82.2% on my, I'm like, I'm just wondering if the same question. Yeah, you can, that, Spencer, you can solve it that way because it doesn't matter how much nitrogen you produce. The percentage, by, uh, the percentage of nitrogen in ammonia is going to decompose into the same percentage of nitrogen and hydrogen. Okay. So all you had to do was divide 14 by 17, and you've got your right answer. Holy crap. Yeah, that's what I said when I looked at this kid's, looked at this kid's uh, uh, answer, and it's like, you know, I can't even take any points away from it because he's absolutely right. Anyway, I probably will do what I said. I'm going to look at this particular question, and I'm going to see if anybody, if, if, I had a, if I had a decent amount of people that did work on it and correct work, then I probably won't do anything. I'll just let it stand. But I'm getting a whole lot of feedback back that you guys did not do well on this. So I'm going to look at it and I may very well decide to drop the question. Bear with me, okay? 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? Hey, further, I just want to let you know that I joined uh, with my cell phone. I'll be back at my house in about uh, five or six minutes. And, also, um, who's I'll speaking? This is uh, Hunter. Thank you, Hunter. Okay. No problem. All right. <coughs> okay. All right. Was it too long? The exam? Yes. Um, no. 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 Was it a fair exam? Did I go over everything except that one problem? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What are your complaints about it? Talk to me. I don't know. I just didn't feel good leaving. I didn't feel confident leaving that exam thinking that I did decent on it. Yeah. Hey, uh, Professor, this is Hunter. I wanted to say, uh, I saw that email. You said you're grading them one at a time or something? Yes. Yeah, right now, I right now, Hunter, I believe your exam is, I think I just graded. Yours was the last one I graded. So you're through four questions. Whatever score you have out of there right now is out of 50 points. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of unclear on what it is. And you said it should be done by uh, later on today or something? Mm, we're going to do my best. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, because I, I saw it and I was like, whoa, what is going on? Yeah, that, that's ba I'm grading them one question at a time. All right, yeah, do what you got to do. Any other any other comments? I'm trying to. Uh, uh, oh, what do they talk it when they bring in a spy? What do they talk about when did they oh. meet? Interrogate? No. Talk about think, a mole? No, no. I'm talking. I'm talking about when. De uh, ah, Jesus! I'm losing my mind. It's, it, yeah, it's basically when you uh, um, talk about an incident that's happened. You're talking about a debriefing. Thank you. Although when I was in high school, debriefing meant a whole different concept. What did it mean? <laughs> it meant to take off your briefs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back, uh, back in, what year? Uh, 1930. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just joking. 75. I graduated high school. All right. Let's get, wow. to, talk. Let's get to talk. Let's get uh, somebody shut off my mic. Thank you. I'm, I didn't, don't need that echo. All right. We have five more periods left, guys. Five. Two periods are going to be spent with gas laws. The better part of one period is going to be sent with Lewis Dots. Next period, valence shell electron pair repulsion. And the last period, we are going to be talking about quantum mechanics. Only have five periods left, guys. Professor, we don't have a final exam for this class, correct? Yes, we do. Oh, God. Yes, we do. I believe if you look at the schedule... You're going to find that the last test is on a Tuesday. The final is the Thursday after that. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, on the quantum, you said quantum mechanics. Are we going to be talking about like, like theoretical stuff or are we no. diving into the math? It's, we are not getting into the math. Hold on, Professor. So, so we're having... going to be like theoretical knowledge about it? Kind of, sort of. It's just going to be a very, very brief overview of quantum mechanics. Okay, good, because I know that I definitely feel the math in that. Uh, yeah, you're, you're talking to somebody that my, my physical chemistry exam had a question on it, and the question was simply derive Schrodinger's equation. And it you're was a mess. I have one... I had one test in that class that aver averaged a 29%. Jeez. Professor, we have this unit test on a Tuesday. And then yes. in that week on Thursday, we have a final. Yep. 
That's rough. Uh, I believe that is true. Let me let. Okay. All right. Let me go back and I will look at the course content and the schedule if I can find it. Nope. That's the schedule. Why is this not allowing me to do anything? Yeah. I can't understand why this is not allowing me to pull up the schedule. All right, hold on a second. This is why I shouldn't talk until I have the information in front of me. I have your final test being on April 29th, which is probably a Thursday. April 29th is a Thursday. You have a week. Your final is scheduled for the 6th of May. That's that's better. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you guys get lucky. The people in HCC don't because their final is on the May 3rd. And their, I'm sorry, their last test is on May 3rd and their finals on the 10th. Um, okay. Any, okay. Qu any more questions, guys? I have a question. I'm here. Yeah, on April 29th, yeah. what time is that test? Same, same, same. Wait, what? Andrew, same, professor. Andrew, right, somebody's got, somebody's got. Yeah. Why is it? Andrew, up? is that you? Yeah, it's me, Andrew. No, no, I'm, I'm saying somebody's Can you guys got. Hear me? Who was just talking? Guys, you need to meet your mic. Thank you. Well, my, man, my mic is muted. Only when I have a question, I unmute it. Okay. But my question is for the lab, do we have a final exam? Yes. Andrew, oh, yeah. Andrew, your question. Gaith, I want you muted to, right now, okay? Only when you ask questions, Gaith. Yeah, I'm, I'm muted. Okay, Andrew, your question. Oh, yeah, the question. question. Uh, it's the same as it was this time, eight to eight. Okay, good. Because I have a dozen appointment. I just want to make sure. Okay. No, eight to eight. Got it. All right. Any other questions? I have a quick one. Are huh? we still doing it where if we get over 90 on each of the exams, we're exempt from the final? Uh, yes. Okay. It's, wait, wait. Kaylin, that is the raw score. Raw score and... That means it's uh, without any extra credit or, uh, Kaylin, I'm trying to figure, what's your last name, Kaylin? Jones. Yeah, there you are. Uh, yes, you're still in the running. Thank you. Yes, if you, are, if you score 90% on the raw exam, you do not, on all four raw exams, you do not, you are exempt from the final. What will happen is your final exam score will be the average of those four test scores. Okay, cool. All Thank right? you. Any other questions? Can I please start the gas laws? Yeah, just in order to start this, I got to find this silly thing. What do you have on your screen right now? The PowerPoint. Thank you. Wonderful. 
All right. What we're going to do with the gas laws, we're going to talk about the properties and conversions. I'm going to talk the way I introduce the gas laws. I talk about the ideal gas law first. Then I go through the individual gas laws. There's one more here. We're going to be dealing with Dalton's gas law as well. And then, yes, ladies and gentlemen, the ideal gas law, you can generate moles. If you can generate moles, stoichiometry will be involved. So we're going to deal with properties and conversions first. Now, if you have a gas, if you put a gas in a container, the gas will not stay in one side of the container or the other. The gas will fill the entire container and it takes the shape of that container. Gases have a very, very low density, especially if you compare them to solids or liquids. Gases are compressible. If you have a mixture of a gas, it is always homogeneous. If I let loose, well, and anybody that's been around a skunk knows that the skunk's odor will fill the entire area around that skunk homogeneously. Gases also flow. So these are some of the properties of gases. I'm going to talk about four specific ones that we measure and that are interrelated. Pressure, volume, temperature, moles. All four of these properties of gases are interrelated and are interdependent upon one another. What I mean by that is if you change one of these properties, you change the other three as well. Now, we have to also define something that is known as standard conditions. This is known as STP. IUPAC, that's the International Union of Professional and Applied Chemists, which is the official club of chemists, maintains that standard temperature is zero Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin. They've defined standard pressure as 10 to the fifth pascals or 0.986 atmospheres. By convention, we generally use one atmosphere as standard pressure. So if I refer to standard temperature and pressure, I'm going to be referring to it as one atmosphere. Now, we have our units of pressure. Anything up here, is anybody familiar with any of these terms? PSI. Where do you know PSI? From tire pressure. It's the English system, that's pounds per square inch. It's the English version of this. Anything else, guys? Pascals. You know Pascals? I mean, that's the measurement I used to use in my other chemistry class. Okay. But in normal, normal life, is there something else that you see here that you recognize from perhaps a newscast? Mm. A specific segment within the newscast that involves clouds. Oh, atmospheres. Not atmospheres. I it involves Pascal. clouds and temperatures and whether it's going to rain and how you know it's going to rain. Millimeters of mercury? Inches of mercury is generally what they do oh. on the weather report. And generally speaking, what it is, is we're talking about a barometer pressure. Okay? So, these are the general units. Atmospheres are what, are what we're seeking. 
We want atmospheres. Tor is just another uh, metric unit that it is that helps to define. That's just another unit of pressure. The only reason, guys, I have these conversions in there is to give you quick access to these conversions. So all you have to do is look up the PowerPoint. There's going to be conversions for pressure. There are going to be conversions for volume. And we're going to have the formulas for temperature in here. Right off the bat. A tor is equal to a millimeter of mercury. Basically, what they did, they had a basin of mercury, and they put a tube in it. What the atmosphere, when the atmospheric pressure pushed down on the mercury, it pushed it up in the tube until a distance between the base of the mercury and the very top of the tube, that distance was 760 millimeters. And they decided, okay, that's going to be what one atmosphere is. So the distance is 760 millimeters. That is equal to one atmosphere, which is also equal to 760 torr. An atmosphere is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury and 14.69 PSIs. And who mentioned Pascal's? I did. I mean, I did say the word. I didn't really mention it. <laughs> All right, Mariah. Mariah's used Pascal's. There are 101,325 Pascal's in one atmosphere or 101.325 kilopascals in one atmosphere. We're dealing with units of volume. We got liters, quarts, milliliters, centimeters cubed, gallons, cubic inches. First of all, realize one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cube, which is equal to one cc. Some of the conversions are right here for you. Again, I wanted to give you easy access to them. Temperature, we're dealing with three different scales. And Kelvin. And again, you've had this at the very beginning of the semester to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade, Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 centigrade plus 32. Kelvin is 273.15 plus the degree centigrade. Any questions about conversions? Dimensional analysis. You're going to be interconverting one thing to another. Now, what exactly is pressure? You guys know uh, pressure. It's, uh, the amount of, uh, Gaith. In between the gas molecules is smaller. Gaith. I'm sorry, Gaith. Your microphone is screwy. My, my phone. My microphone is not on. That was Hunter. That was Hunter. No, it's Hunter's Galaxy. Yeah, yeah, me, it's you, Hunter. Yeah, it's pretty bad, but I'm I'm about to sign in. I'm about to sign in on my computer now. Okay, Hunter, don't talk in that voice. You're freaking me out. Anybody, anybody tell me what pressure is. How do you get pressure? You have a balloon that's blown up. How do you know the inside of that balloon has pressure on it? It expands. Expands and floats. Yeah. It expands until the pressure inside the balloon equals the pressure outside. But how do you know what keeps the balloon expanded? Physically, what keeps the balloon expanded? It's trapped inside the balloon, right? Is that what you're asking? Uh, Mila, what? 
Because it's like trapped inside the balloon. What's trapped? The gases. So are the gases hitting the outside walls of that balloon? Technically, yes. Not technically, they are. They are? Okay. <laughs> so literally speaking, when that each gas molecule is hitting the outside of that balloon, it's hitting it with a force. And this force is called pressure. Pressure is force per unit area. Can you let Hunter into the class? He's on his No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do I have to? Yes. <laughs> okay, so what pressure, pressure results literally from the individual atoms of the molecules banging against the outside walls of the container. That's why a tire gets inflated. Can you, can you hear me a lot better on here, right? Yes, I can, Hunter. Okay. And to answer the question about the, the gas thing, aren't the, uh, the gas molecules closer together? Uh, like when it's, when it's um, under pressure, like the more pressure there is, the less space those gas molecules are like bouncing around, right? No, it's not a question of that, Hunter. You, you have a couple things. You can increase pressure in several ways. One of which is if you put more gas in there. If you put more gas in there, then you have more molecules hitting the outside of the container. More molecules, more pressure. Okay? Or if you increase the temperature. What happens is you make the molecules of gas move faster. So say if it, just as a rough example, say at 20 degrees, it takes uh, three seconds for a gas molecule to go from one end of the balloon to the other. If you increase that to 40, that's going to occur in one and a half seconds. But what you've done there is you've now doubled the collisions. So there are various ways in which you can increase pressure. Now, guys, at sea level, as I was talking, when you have atmospheric pressure hitting on a, a liquid amount of mercury, this atmospheric pressure pushes it down and it pushes the mercury up this column. If there is one atmosphere pressure, then this column goes up 760 millimeters, or it goes up 29.92 inches, which relates one thing with the other conversion-wise. So we have conversions. Pressure of air in a tire is measured to be 45 PSI. Represent this pressure in atmospheres. Uh, Victoria. Yes. You have 45 PSI. How are you going to get atmospheres? Straight dimensional analysis problem. So you take 45 PSI, I guess you times it by one atmosphere over 14.69 PSI? Exactly. Okay. I don't have my calculator, so I can't. Oh, yes, I do. Wait a minute. It's 3.1 yeah. atmospheres. Okay. Now, 45 PSI is equal to 3.1 atmospheres because we just multiplied it by one atmosphere over 14.69 PSI. So I have 3.1 atmospheres. How many tor is this? Mila. If I have 3.1 atmospheres, okay. I want to change that into tor. So what am I going to do? Um, so you're going to take, atmosphere is the ATM, right? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, how many atmosphere do I have? 3.1. 3.1, so and I'm making it into tour? 
Yes. Okay, so then I would do um, 3.1 times one or one over 760. I want tour. So if I want tour, is it going to go on the top or bottom of oh, my the fraction? On the top. So it's going to be the 3.1 and then times the 760 over one. Okay. Hunter, I've got 3.1 atmospheres. How many Pascal do I have? Just set the problem up. And I think Hunter's having some problems here. Uh, Armethia. No, I was going to get my pen out. I'm sorry. No, just yeah, set it up. That's all I'm asking is for you to set it up. You have 3.1 atmospheres, and you know the conversion is one atmosphere is equal to 101,325 Pascals. Yes. So you put the uh, three-point atmosphere over... Now that's what uh, we're starting with, Armethia. Okay. So so you tap to get the one over... Uh, no, the, uh, the Pascal over one. Exactly. So, you're going to take the 3.1 and you're going to multiply it by 101, 325 Pascals per one atmosphere and you're going to come up with this number. All we're doing, guys, dimensional analysis. Now, I told you that the four properties are interrelated. The way they get interrelated is through something called the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is going to relate all four properties, all four interdependent properties of a gas. And it does it by PV is equal to N. You're going to have to realize that N means moles. PV is equal to NRT. So what I'm doing is I'm multiplying the pressure of the gas times the volume of that gas. That's going to equal the number of moles of the gas times R, which is this constant, times the temperature. What does T stand for? Temperature. Okay, temperature. Okay, and then the N stands for moles? N stands for moles. P is pressure. V is volume. Okay, and R is going to be the... It's going to be the constant. Constant. Oh, I thought R was like 8.31 or something. That's joules per... Uh, I think it's joules per mole Kelvin. Oh, so it's just different, like. Okay. Uh, who's talking? Who just asked me the question? I did. Uh, Who was I did? <laughs> Who was I did? Oh, Mariah. I'm sorry, Mariah. Okay, Mariah. You use 8.31. That had a different label. R is a constant, but the, the number, the physical number you're seeing here is dependent upon what labels are used to calculate the number. So if I am measuring my volume in liters, my pressure in atmospheres, moles or moles, and I have my T is Kelvin, then my R value is going to be 0 0.08206. You're going to use the 8.31 value when you get to CHEM2. And I'm trying to find it. Let me find the Nernst equation. And I'm sorry, I just, I want to make sure that I get this right. And everybody can blame Mariah for this because she brought up the 8.31. I'm just wondering because I'm used to using that. Uh, okay. And I am not finding it quickly.
<sighs> Where is that at? Okay. It, that's, I'm sorry. It was not important. Maria, you can still use that number if you convert everything to the label for that number. It's easier, guys. Trust me. Just to be able to convert the pressure to atmospheres, the volume to liters, temperature to Kelvin, and the volume and the number of particles to moles. Mariah, stay after class, and I'll, I'll work this through with you, okay? Mariah? All right, so the ideal gas law is going to relate all four of these properties. Now, why is it called the ideal gas law? It's the ideal gas law because it's how an ideal gas would act independent of everything else. It's saying that there is no reaction between one gas molecule and another. We're not worried about collisions. We're only worried about the molecules acting on their own. So, let's think about this for a second. If I have a pressure and I have a volume, that's equal to a number of moles, my constant, and my temperature. Is there anything that says I can't rearrange this to have P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to R? Is there anything that says algebraically that I can't do this? All right. If I change every one of those parameters, if I change the pressure, volume, number of moles, and the temperature, aren't those also equal to R? So if they're both equal to R, that makes them equal to each other. So I have P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to P2, V2 over N2, T2. This is, this is the equation you need to memorize. You need to know this particular equation. Strategy when you're using the gas laws. If you have three of those properties, pressure, volume, moles, and temperature, and none of the parameters are changing, what you're going to do is you're going to plug those three values into the ideal gas law and solve for the fourth property. Again, if you have three of the four properties, the four properties being pressure, volume, moles, and temperature, if you have three of those values and none of them is changing, then you are going to use the ideal gas law. PV is equal to NRT. But if you have values that are changing, what you have to do is you have to look at the problem. You have to see what's changing and see what's staying the same. Then you're going to employ the equation. P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to P2, V2 over N2, T2. What you're going to do is you are going to eliminate the things that are not changing. And you're going to keep in this big, big-ass equation, you're going to keep everything that changes. You're going to keep everything that changes. If it stays the same, you're going to get rid of it. Problem. A sample of hydrogen gas 
has a volume of 8.56 liters at a temperature of zero Celsius and a pressure of 1.5 atmospheres. Calculate the number of moles of hydrogen in this gas sample. Looking at the equation, Armethia, I know I asked you something earlier. Armethia. Yes. Look, look at this equation. Uh -huh. Are any of the parameters changing? Did I say I was increasing or decreasing the volume? No. Increasing or decreasing the temperature or pressure? No. So I have three things that are staying the same. Yes. I have five variable, or four variables in this equation and a constant. Yes. I know the values of three of them. All I'm going to do is solve for the fourth. Now, because the value of R has a very specific label, I have to make sure that the volume is in liters, pressure is in atmospheres, I've changed my temperature to Kelvin, uh -huh. and my moles are in moles. Okay. So, Armethia, what is the pressure? Um, is our nope. Look at the pro look at the question. The question is this what I've just hot that's not highlight, not allowing me to highlight. From A to sample. That is the question. Yeah. So you have to put the, the temperature and the into Calvin. Okay. I'm going to add 273 to zero. So my degrees Kelvin are 273. Okay. Do I know what the volume is, Mark Armethia? Would it be the liters or the ATM? The, the volume is going to be liters. Okay. Pressure is going to be ATM. So all I'm doing, all I've done here is Armethia changed the degrees centigrade into degrees Kelvin. I'm going to plug that in where T is. R is going to be the value you see on the screen. My V is going to be 8.56. My P is going to be 1.5. So I plug that in, and then all I got to do is solve for my N. And in this particular case, it ends up being 0.573 moles. Questions on this? Can you just keep it on the screen for a minute? I'm sorry. Oh. Thank you. Professor, is it okay for us to just use 273 instead of 273.15? It depends. It's like the diapers I'm wearing now. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mar uh, sorry, Maria. If it's I told you that the temperature was measured at 25.1, could you use just 273? I don't know. Well, would you be limiting your significant figures of your data? Yeah, so in this case, we would need three sig figs. This case, we would need three sig figs because it's zero. But if it's something like 26.5, you add 273.2, and that makes it, God, I can't. Plus, what did I say, 26.5? So you get 299.7. If your temperature is 32.05, then you use the 273.15. Does that make sense, Maria? Um, 
it's Rosina, but yes. Rosina, I'm sorry, Rosina. No problem, thank you. I have a quick question. Um, I'll get you more in a minute. Um, when you- I wanna know what he's getting more of. Some milk. <laughs> uh -huh. Or bread. <laughs> I think, it was, I think it was scotch. You could have talked me into it. <laughs> um, and the, the, like in the middle line, you have the um, N and then the parentheses um, 0 0.08206 2, 0, and then LATM, you know, are you plugging in like the number for liters, the number for eights from the original equation and then getting that number and then multiplying? No, 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 no. This number is a constant. Oh, so that you just don't, okay. As long as your volume is in liters, your pressure is in atmospheres, and your temperature is in Kelvin, and your moles are moles, then that is the number. And so, look, look what happens here, Mila. Yes. I've got this liter atmospheres over Kelvin mole, right? Yeah. And I'm multiplying it by Kelvin. So the Kelvins yes. go away. Yeah. I'm also multiplying it by moles. So the moles go away. Okay. Yeah. If so I go ahead. So it's just like, um, really the only numbers you're using for that, like you're doing the 0 0.0860 or 0 0.08206 times the 273. And like the rest of those just kind of drop off when you get the answer. No, no. Well, you're going to have to. With the rest of the equation. Uh, let me see what I can do. Maybe I'll. Sorry, Professor. Maybe I'll skip the step. Out. I think it's if not... I see it, like, yeah, like I think it, I think I just am um, not able to like visualize the steps that's happening here, which is kind of really throwing me off. I'm sorry. Mila, does that make more sense to you? Is this making more sense to you now? Yeah. It's okay. just all the extras in there was kind of throwing me off. All right. Let's get another problem. What volume is occupied by 11.0 grams of carbon dioxide at 25 degrees Celsius and 371 tour. Again, look at the problem. Is anything changing? No, but we have to do a lot of converting. Nothing is changing, but we've got to do a lot of converting. If nothing is changing, we're going to use the ideal gas law. PV is equal to NRT. Okay. Do we have the ability to get the moles of the carbon dioxide? Yes, because we can convert to grams to liters, the Celsius. No, no, no. No. How are you going to convert grams to liters? I don't know. It's just wishful thinking. I thought this would be an easy one. <laughs> uh, he tried. Let me see That's what here. counts. <laughs> let me see who's out there. Chase. Yes. Can you get moles from 11 grams of carbon dioxide? Uh, yes. How are you going to do that? You take the 11 grams and then you multiply that by one over the car uh, atomic weight of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide weighs 44. How many moles do you have? I'm going to need a second. So, one are you actually using a calculator to divide 11 by 44? Oh, is that all you have to do is four? Sorry. No, 11 divided by 44. Point four? Yeah, man. Who uses a calculator for 11 divided by four? Just kidding. How are you <laughs> solve it? <laughs> it's one fourth. So I'm just teasing. Five. Look, Professor, math is scary, okay? Python, professor, I've had a very long day. My 
I'm, I'm just along for the ride. Okay, use your calculator. What's the number? 11 divided by 44. 0.25. Thank you. Or a quarter. All right. So we have 0 0.250 moles of carbon dioxide. Can we convert the 25C to Kelvin? For sure, for sure. All right, Kate, do it. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm just filling in, okay? Kate, how do you convert? How do you convert Celsius to Kelvin? Well, first, we have to figure out the laden uh, shadow of a... Uh, exactly. Add it to the 273. Thank you, Armethia. We have a semblance of sanity in here. I was if just about got, to say that. Okay. If you have 25 degrees Celsius, you add 273 to it, that's going to give you 298 Kelvin. Now, with this, this obviously isn't going to be when you add the 0.15. No, you didn't. You don't have to add the point fifteen Unless because the Celsius is a, a decimal. Correct. Okay. Now, how are we going to convert three seventy one tor? Anybody remember the conversion? First of all, what are we looking for for pressure? What is the label we're looking for for pressure? In the atmosphere. Atmospheres. So one atmosphere equals 760 tor. So if I have 371 tor, tell me how I'm going to get the atmospheres. You would take that number when you just do dimensional analysis. So take that number times it by one atmosphere over 760 or whatever it was. Exactly. Exactly. So the bottom line. If we're using PV equals NRT and we want to use our R, our R value of 0 0.08206, the volume has to be in liters, the pressure in atmospheres, temperature in Kelvin, and we have to have moles. So I've got 0 0.250 moles. My pressure is 0.488 atmospheres, and my temperature is 298. All I have to do now is plug it into the ideal gas law. I do that, and I get a volume of 12.5 liters. Questions? Questions, ladies and gentlemen? Can you please go back really quick? I'm sorry. Okay, I got it now. Thank you. Okay. Do you remember Avogadro? Yeah. Yes. All right. What he was really famous for. He came up with the discovery that moles of a gas and the volume are directly proportional. To relate moles with volume, our pressure and our temperature must remain constant. So what he's saying is that the volume of the gas is related directly to the number of moles. And they're equal to a constant if the pressure and temperature are constant. So if you take the volume and you divide it by the number of moles, you will get a constant as long as the pressure and the temperature are constant. Now, what, hap what happens to V if I increase N? All right, let me put it to you this way. Say K is equal to 1. Okay? Every time I divide the volume by the moles, I get a number 1. And let's say my volume is 2 and my moles are 2. 
if I increase my moles to four, what has to happen to the volume? It goes up as well. Goes up by four? No, it goes up. <laughs> Who said it goes down? I need you to identify yourself. Was it Mariah? I yeah, I guess. Okay, Mariah. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to reach a constant number. So if my moles goes up from two to four, and I say that my constant is equal to one, then if my moles are four and my constant is one, what does my volume have to be? I don't know. This is something you need. You're going to need to. Yeah, exactly. Because you said it's a, the direct relationship of V and N. If N goes to. I may have to take this, guys. I'm sorry. Hold on. Man, I paid for this class. <laughs> Okay, offer me a million dollars at yours. If not, buy. Sorry about that, guys. I'm waiting for a call from my doctor and uh I get an offer for my house. So I just told them if they offer a million dollars, they can have it. If not, leave me alone. Okay, Mariah, you still out Take there? all in over here. Yeah. Mariah, I'm saying my volume divided by my number of moles is equal to a constant. If that constant is one and I have a volume of two and a moles of two, if I take the bottom half and make that a four, what has to go on top of the four to equal one? Oh, four. I get it. So the two has to also increase. So basically, what did all Avogadro is saying is the more gas you have, the bigger your volume is going to be. Conversely, the smaller, the less gas, smaller the version. Can anybody come up with an example? Everybody's done it. Have you ever blown up a balloon? Mila, your son's name is? Theo. Theo, have you ever blown up a balloon? <laughs> yes, we have. Theo, when you put more air in the balloon, Theo, when you put more air in the balloon, did it get bigger? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's all we're talking about. A nice analogy for Avogadro's law is you blow <laughs> into a balloon, it gets, the volume gets bigger. When you're blowing into the balloon, aren't you putting more gas in there? So you're putting more moles of gas in there. The volume is getting bigger. Now, if we have V over N is equal to a constant, then if we change the volume and the moles, that's also going to equal to the same constant, is it not? So if I have my initial conditions, V1 over the number of moles, that's equal to constant. If I change the volume and the moles, that's also going to equal the constant. So I can take this and I can eliminate the constant. And I have an expression that we can usually use. My first volume divided by my first number of moles is going to be equal to my second volume 
divided by the second number of moles. Remember, if we have three values and nothing's changing, the ideal gas law pertains. If I have values that are changing, I determine what's changing and what's not. For Avogadro, what did we say was constant? The 6.022. Nope. For Avogadro's law, what did we say had to stay constant? The temperature. Temp temperature and what else? It's STP, right? Oh. So nope, not STP. Rosina, we're not dealing with STP. No, not at all. Pressure? Pressure and temperature must be constant in order for Avogadro's law to prevail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook it. Remember that big equation I told you about? Remember, I also told you we're going to keep what's changing and we are going to eliminate what stays the same. Pressure stays the same, so we're going to get rid of it. My temperature stays the same, so I'm going to get rid of it. It makes sense, guys, because if the pressure doesn't change, isn't P2 equal to P1? Yes. If the pressure doesn't change, P1 is equal to P2. If the temperature doesn't change, isn't T2 equal to T1? Yes. So if I'm equating in this big long equation, T1 and T2, if I'm taking one of these to the other, one's going to go on top. And if they're equal, they are going to cancel out. If I take P2, P1 to the other side, it's going to be the same as P2. It's going to cancel out, which leaves me with V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. The main obstacle when we're doing these equations is keeping the condition straight. We need to know what volume goes with what number of moles. A 32, a 32.5 moles of a gas occupies 45 liters. How many moles are present when that gas occupies 60 liters? Temperature and pressure are constant. Is something changing, guys? Yes, the volume is changing. The volume is changing? Yes. And what else is implied? The temperature and pressure are constant. Temperature and pressure are constant. What about the number of moles? Is that changing? Yes. Yes. Cool. So... If I employ my P1, V1, N1, T1 equal P2, V2 over N2, T2, pressure and temperature are constant. Eliminate them. So I have V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. So all I'm going to do is plug my 45 liters as V1, my 32 and a half moles as N1, I know that's going to be equal to 60 liters on top over N2. And then you just cross multiply? Yeah. Is cross this basically like titrate doing that? I'm sorry, Victoria? Is that is this basically like doing a titrate problem? Is that it? Because it's like if you have... Um, no. Like M1, M1 V1 equals uh, m2v2 is not like that if you want to solve how to find your your missing component there it's kind of the same in the fact that there are four values and you know three of them yeah all right it's similar in that fashion okay when i talk about boyle's law boyle's law 
represent is a better representation of M1V1 than Avogadro's is. Oh, okay. And we'll get to that momentarily. Okay. At sea level, in room temperature, a balloon can be inflated to a maximum volume of 3.35 liters. You've already blown 2.83 moles into the balloon, and you've achieved 2.76 liters. How much more air do you need to push into the balloon before it bursts? So 3.35 over 2.83 equals 2.76 over X. Look at the problem, Mila. No. But I'm... Would you do the 2.76 over 2.83? Because you're yeah. getting the maximum volume of 335. Okay. And then we're reaching the max. Okay, I get it. All right, so... Chase, that's good, good. You're going to take the 2.76, okay. put it over the 2.83. That's going to equal 3.35 liters over X. Turns out that X is equal to 3.43 moles. Now, look at the question. Wait, hold on a second. Was that right? Okay. Yes, it is right. So then you subtract the um, moles? Exactly. The question asks, how much more air would you need to put in? You put in 2.83 already. In order to burst the balloon, you got to put in at least 3.44 moles. You've already got 2.83 in there. Subtract those two values and you will have the amount more that you need to put in there to burst the balloon. I have a 12.2 liter sample that contains half a mole of oxygen gas at a pressure of one atmospheres and a temperature of 25 Celsius. If all of my O2 is converted to ozone, at the same temperature and pressure, what will the volume of ozone formed be? Riddle me this. If I have half a mole of O2, can you tell me how many moles of ozone I have based upon what's on the screen right now? Would it be 0.25? How did you get that? Because that's that 0.5 is for two, and then you're adding on another one, so it'd be 0.75. Right? I feel like I've been wrong all, all class, so I'm not confident in that at all. No, you're, you're not correct. Okay. <laughs> if I... Guys, if you have half a mole of oxygen gas, O2... Can you tell me how many moles of ozone you produce if you convert all of the oxygen into ozone? Are you looking, is, is this like the equation you're asking for? Can you do the stoichiometry? Yes. You yeah. Go ahead, what's the answer, Chase? Um. Would you take Point three, three? You take the moles and then you divide it by three over two. Three over two? Two two over three. Two over three. Two over three. So I got point five oh times two divided by three. And I believe was that Mariah that came up with point three three? No, it was Apple Grace. Apple Grace, good job. Good job, Apple Grace. Point three three is the correct answer. 
So I have 0.33 moles of O3. Now, it occupied 12.2 liters with 0.50 moles. How many liters is it going to occupy at 0.33 moles? Set up the proportion. What goes on top of what? Kaylin, rescue me, Kaylin. Hello. Okay, Kaylin, would you agree there's 0.33 moles of, of ozone? Yes. All right. So I want to know what the volume of the ozone okay. is going to have. So uh, V1 is 12.2 over... Half a mole is equal to V2 over the 0.33 of a mole. Anybody have any problems with that? And we end up with 8.1 liters. Again, guys, these problems, it's important to keep the parameters of one set of conditions together and separate from the other set of conditions. Uh, I'm gonna have a, gonna get be able to get through Boyle's law. Second law, we have four of these to go through. The second one is Boyle's law that relates pressure and volume. So if we're relating pressure and volume, that means that moles and temperature must be constant. The volume of a gas is indirectly proportional, proportional to its pressure. In other words, as the pressure goes up, volume goes down. As the pressure goes down, volume goes up. Think about squeezing a balloon. Aren't you, when you squeeze that balloon, aren't you reducing the volume of the balloon? And think, as you're squeezing that balloon, isn't it pushing back more than it did before? The smaller you make that volume, it's pushing back more and more. So for Boyle's Law, we have pressure times volume is equal to a constant. At a constant temperature in moles, we get PV is equal to a constant. If we change the pressure in the volume, first set of conditions, first P times the first volume is equal to that constant, which is equal to the second pressure times the second volume. P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. If we look at our major equation, if we cancel out, if N and T are not changing, we can cancel them out. And if we cancel them out, we're left with P1V1 is equal to P2V2. When a spark plug ignites gasoline, a car piston has a pressure of 6.45 atmospheres and a volume of 135 centimeters. When the piston reaches its maximum volume, it's 426. What is the pressure at that point? Assume that the gasoline was immediately combusted and the temperature does not vary. Are we increasing the moles? Are the moles changing? No. Nope. No. Is the temperature changing? No. So N and T are constant. They're not changing. So if N and T are not changing, or 
if n and t are not changing, we can eliminate them and we're left with the equation P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So, uh, Jennifer. Yes. Can you set this problem up for me? Okay. Let me pull. So, the boil is going to be 6.45 over 135 centimeters. Nope, 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 nope. Look at the equation. Oh, multiply. That's right. That's right. So it would be, okay, so it'd be 6.45 ATM times 135 centimeters. Cubed. Is equal to? Uh, 426 centimeters cubed X ATM times X ATM. Temperature moles are the constants. We identify the equation as being Boyle's law, which is P1 V1 equal P2 V2. We plug in our parameters and we get 2.04 atmospheres. Questions, ladies and gentlemen? Questions? So even for using this equation, we do need to convert it to liters, right? No. No, you okay. don't, because look. Look what's happening to the one liter over 1,000 milliliters. Cancels divide, I'm dividing it. It cancels out. You don't need to. Okay. It doesn't matter. I changed this to quartz. It doesn't matter. As long as they are the same on both sides. As long as they're the same on both sides, you don't have to convert it. Rosina. Rosina. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You got a one and a half liter sample at a pressure of 56 torr. That gas is increased in pressure to 150 torr. First of all, if I'm increasing the pressure, are you expecting the volume to go up or down? Volume to go up. Down. Uh, okay, down. Remember, if this goes up, this has to go down. Yeah. If this goes down, that has to go up. So right. we're increasing the pressure. So the volume should go down. Down. Okay. Is that why no. in the summer with tires, like the hotter it gets, the lower the pressure in your. No, no, the other way around. Other way around. So the hotter it gets, the higher the pressure? Yes. Yeah, when it gets cold, you'll see they drop. Okay. Uh, we're gonna. That's another law we're going to get into probably the next time. So, Rosina, set up my problem. So, P1 is 56. Uh, sorry, P1 is 150. Oh, no, sorry. P1 is 56 and P2 is 150. And V1 is 1.5. So, it's going to be 1.5 times 56 is equal to 150 times X and whatever is the math. The math ends up being 0.56 liters. Are these hard problems, guys? No. It's just a matter of plugging in, isn't it? Yeah. So the bottom line is you got to be able to recognize. You got to be able to recognize which equation you need to use. And if the way you recognize what equation you need to use, you look at what's changing and what's staying the same. Keep what's changing, get rid of what's staying the same, and you're going to be fine with that. I have a question. The reason, just kind of for my understanding, um, when the pressure goes up, the volume goes down, is that like, um, if you were to say like a balloon, as it's like filling up. All right, all right, wait, are we talking temperature and volume or are we talking pressure, pressure and temperature? Um, pressure and temperature. Or no. When you were just saying like the P, if the P goes up and the V goes down. Yeah, so then pressure and, and volume. Okay. Mila? 
I'm, oh. I'm, so, I'm so tired today. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm not with you. Okay. <laughs> we have P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2, right? Okay. So if my pressure increases, what has to happen? Well, no, let me do that again. Let's draw the atmosphere, the thing that we had before. I have one pressure that's associated with one temperature. Okay. All right. Now, say you're in Florida. It's a nice 80 degrees down here in December. And for whatever God knows reason, you decide you want to drive to Milwaukee where it is minus 26. Okay. So the temperature has gone down, correct? Yes. So if the pressure, if the temperature goes down, what also has to happen to the pressure? It goes down also. It goes down also because this ratio, if this goes down, the pressure also has to go down because you've got this ratio of P1 over T1 equal P2 over T2. Okay. And we will get into Guy Lussac's law tomorrow, as well as Charles's law. Wait, tomorrow? Uh, Monday, yes. Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> We're going to finish this all up on Tuesday. Okay? Sounds good. So we are going to be, right now we're at around 50. We got to get through ah, about halfway. There we go. About halfway through. So we'll get through the next half of this on Tuesday. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? All right. All right. Thank you, Professor. I'll see no. you in a minute. Bye. Bye, Theo. Theo, what happens when you blow up a balloon? Does it get bigger? Say yeah. Say yeah. He gets so shy. <laughs> bye, Theo. Say bye. Time for bed. <laughs> we'll see you in a bit. Take care. Well, we don't have lab, do we? Yeah, tonight? Yes, we do. Oh, well, that's on Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There are some people, Hunter, that have lab tonight. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah, if you have lab normally on Thursday, yes, you have lab tonight. And God help me, but I don't even know what it is. I have to go look it up. Anybody know offhand what we're dealing with? Yeah. I think it's the same solutions. Thing. Solutions. All right, I'll Professor. See you on Tuesday, Okay, guys, I will see you on Tuesday. Some of you, I will see you at 730. Hey, I hope you get that million-dollar offer. <laughs> yeah. All right, see you on Tuesday. Take care. Oh, wait. Um, so you, you said that you've only graded four questions? Out of nine, yes. Out of nine? Okay. Hunter, if you look at your score, it's out of 50 points so far. Okay, that's not too bad then. All right. I, I'm going to, I'm getting to them as I get to them, Hunter. All right, sounds good. I just wanted to make sure nobody freaked out by seeing a 50. Yeah, no, and I, had my heart, I saw that and my heart started like racing. Sorry, I, I was right after I did that, I was right on there with the email. Right, Nila, Omar, Rosina, do you need anything from me? Oh, there goes two of them. Take care, Hunter. Rosina, Neela, Neela, do you need anything? No, I'm pretty much good. I'll see you in lab. Does this make sense, Neela, to you? Yes, it does. All right, Omar, are you there? Omar always comes in and then goes away. Omar, are you there? <laughs>